historical stock and bond prices. So let's look at the next five slides. Financial markets. What do you mean by financial markets and why are they important? Financial market is not necessarily a physical location where um, something is traded. It's something more general than that. So all the different ways um, <clears throat> that equity securities, also known as stocks, and debt securities, also known as bonds, both issued by companies, right, are bought and sold. So who sells them? Companies. Also, governments can sell debt securities or bonds. Who buys stocks and bonds? Um, anybody you can think of. Investors, you know, people like us, other companies, other governments, investors and governments and companies in other countries, and so on. Also, you can see that financial markets is a way of bringing buyers and sellers of these financial assets together. <clears throat> Um, the existence of financial markets, the existence of this um, possibility to buy and sell stocks and bonds allows companies, governments and individuals to, as we say in finance or economics, to increase their utility. Uh, what does it mean? Those, uh, this, so we have savers and borrowers. Savers are those who have extra money. Borrowers are those who need money. So savers are, for example, people like us who have extra cash and we are willing to invest it into bonds and stocks. So savers have the ability to use the financial markets to invest in financial assets, stocks and bonds, so that they can defer consumption, right? Because they have extra money now that they don't really need. So they sort of put it aside, invest, wait a while, earn a return on it, and um, you know this is in a way a compensation for uh, postponing spending the money, right? So they're you know, allowing the money to be used by somebody else, they wait maybe several years, and then they get the money back and they're compensated with a return paid in the form of, let's say, dividends if that was stocks or coupon payments if that was bonds. On the other side, we have borrowers, those who need money. And in this chapter, we are talking about companies that need money, for example, to expand. So how do companies raise money? They, they can sell, uh, they can sell um, bonds. Technically, by borrowers, we also mean um, raising money by selling stocks. So stock is, you know, it's not really debt to a firm, but it has, you know, those kind of features that debt securities or bonds have. And that's kind of how we are looking at stocks in this chapter. So firms that need money, they can sell bonds as well as stocks. Um, and they do that because they have access to uh, this capital through the financial markets. So there are a lot of trading platforms uh, well organized that allow firms to raise money through these two different sources, selling stocks and selling bonds. <clears throat> and uh, the reason firms you know, raise money is so that they can invest the raised money into assets, maybe you know, their expansion projects, whatever that might be, that would generate profits. So it's a win-win situation. Savers, they, you know, people like us, for example, they invest money that we don't really need at the moment into stocks and bonds. And we earn return, you know, from the company, right? Um, and the companies, they get the money from us and the way they benefit is they invest our money into their uh, projects that also bring them, um, you know, returns. So of course there is risk in, you know, involved in this process. Uh, savers cannot be sure 100% that they will get their uh, returns, such as dividends or coupon payments, as well as borrowers, the companies that raise money. Um, 
they cannot be 100% sure that uh, the, you know, all those projects that the money will be invested into will be profitable. So it's kind of like, you know, this um, a risky, you know, process for both, uh, you know, sides of the uh, financial markets. But we won't focus too much on this sort of very general uh, big picture. So let's <clears throat> zoom in. Let's look at historical stock and bond prices. What do we see on this picture? This is figure 12.4 in our textbook. Uh, this is a $1 investment in different types of portfolios between December 31st, 1925 and December 31st, 2016. <clears throat> What's going on here? On the horizontal axis, you see um, a timeline. It starts in the year 1925 and ends in the year 2016. Then along the vertical axis, we have uh, dollar amounts. Everything in 1925 starts with $1. <clears throat> so imagine you had, you know, a great, great grandfather and he had a few friends, and they all decided to invest the same amount of money, but into different things. Uh, let's say your great-great-grandfather invested $1 into small company stocks. So this is the green line on this figure. What are small company stocks? They're also known as small cap stocks. This is a portfolio. So the term for portfolio, it will actually come up um, in chapter 13, our next chapter. But it means you're not buying just one company stocks, but you're buying stocks from um, several different companies. And uh, small companies or small cap stocks means you're buying stocks of the smallest 20% of the companies whose stocks are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So that's what um, the first um, you know, investor uh, invested his one dollar into. Then the second person instead invested his one dollar into large company stocks. Large company stocks is a portfolio of stocks of 500 largest companies in the United States. So you can think of these small cap stocks and the large company stocks being on the opposite ends of the spectrum of stocks you could be buying by company size. Then the third person also invested $1 in 1925, but he invested his money into long-term government bonds, the blue line. Um, long-term means bonds that um, pay coupon payments over a long time period. Um, so think of 20 years to maturity. And then the fourth person in 1925 also invested $1, but his money was invested into treasury bills. Treasury bills or T-bills are also government bonds, but very short-term government bonds. They pay coupons over just a few months. So think of three months to maturity. And you can ignore one extra line that this graph has called inflation. We are not going to be talking about it. So focus on these four lines, small cap stocks, large company stocks, long term and uh, government bonds and treasury bills. <clears throat> Let's start with the following. What differences can you notice between the investments? So how about I rephrase this question? If you were that person um, who invested $1 in 1925, and let's say you lived until now, right, 2016, which investment uh, was the best one? Like, what would have been the smartest investment to invest $1 into? And you're probably thinking, well, the small company stocks, the line that's uh, the highest up on this figure, right? And you're probably saying that because in 2016, that $1 grew to $33,214.15. That's way above 
uh, the ending values of the other three investments. For the large company stocks, that's only $6,029.16. For long-term government bonds, it's much, much smaller, only $133.19. And for the treasury bills, the short-term government bonds, it's only $20.62. <clears throat> um, when if this is how you are determining which investment has been the best then you're basically talking about the trend like which line has reached the highest point right in other words which line has been sort of the steepest going up at the fastest rate that's the trend and it's true that the small company stocks have increased in price the most in other words in other words, uh, they brought the highest return over this 91-year time period between 1925 and 2016. But there is a different way to look at this graph. If the question is uh, which investment has uh, been the best, and this is from the point of view of you know how jumpy the lines are right how much the investment value was fluctuating along the way uh, so if you look at those jumps which means in some years you your investment is worth a lot of money next year you lose a lot of money right in terms of the jumps which line jumps the most it's the small company stock which is also the one with the steepest trend right so small company stocks have been jumping up and down the most, which makes the small company stock investment the riskiest. And now you may notice this trade-off between the risk and the return on an investment. So the small company stocks have um, generated the highest return, but this investment has also been the riskiest. The large company stocks um, are, you know, um, have also produced a very good return, second highest, and they're not fluctuating as much. They still go up and down quite a bit, but not nearly as, you know, much as the, the small company stocks and so on. So the risk and return, they kind of go together across these four historical investments. So to summarize, small company stocks had the highest average annual return. Then go the large company stocks. Then go the long-term government bonds. And then at the bottom are the treasury bills. The textbook, the textbook also, you know, kind of here and there inserts short-term government bonds, which fit between the long-term bonds and the very short-term three-month treasury bills. <clears throat> um, so now let's see how would we calculate the historical average annual return. Let's denote the return by with capital R and to indicate that that's the average return, let's put a bar above it. So our bar is the average 